My name is James. I'm an alcoholic. I brought this smart water with me. Have you seen this? Smart water? Somebody gave me one of these a couple weeks ago. I couldn't get it open. (laughs) I had to give it to my sponsor to get it open. Whiskey was kind of like that for me. I thought it made me smart. but And a better dancer and better driver. Better lover. It didn't. What it, what it really did is it, it taught me how to lie to myself. But I love, I love whiskey. I love scotch. In fact, I'd still be a virgin if it wasn't for scotch. Can you identify with that? My sobriety date is December the 6th, 1982. It's the last time I smoked pot. And I was smoking pot because I had a problem with alcohol. Maybe, maybe you can identify with that. I got to a place in my life where I, I could clearly see that alcohol was a problem in my life. But I hadn't found you yet. And I, I, didn't know, I didn't know what to do, but I wanted to not have the consequences that I was having drinking. So I decided to quit. And uh, the best thing that I could figure out was smoke pot. <laughs> so I smoked pot so I wouldn't drink. And uh, I'm here to tell you that that doesn't work. Is anybody here smoking pot tonight? Uh, keep coming back. Because the people that I hang out with, we don't call that sobriety. I don't do any mind-altering chemicals. During the time that I was not drinking, thinking that I was okay because I had identified my problem as alcohol, I thought I was doing all right. My sister came to AA, and her life started to get better. And uh, mine really wasn't getting any better, although I wasn't drinking. And uh, she kept saying to me, why don't you come to AA? And what she said to me is, you'll like the people, and the people will like you. She knew something about how lonely I was. I didn't know how lonely I was, but she, I think she did. And she's sitting in the room tonight, and I, I owe my life to her. And she brought me to you. And it turns out that she was right. You liked me, and I liked you. And I've been here ever since. And uh, But the problem was, when I got here... I wasn't an alcoholic. I wasn't even drinking. How could you be an alcoholic if you don't even drink? And uh, so I had a little trouble identifying with being an alcoholic. And I was introducing myself as an existentialist, <laughs> and um, which I which I am or was. And uh, I just I, I just didn't want to be alcoholic. I, I thought it's got to be. I knew there was something wrong with me. I, I knew I was broken somehow. But uh, uh, please don't make it be, don't, no, I don't want to be alcoholic. Can it be something else? I was thinking if I had a multiple choice, I would have picked something like leprosy or something. I, I just, oh, don't make me be alcoholic. It's like, I thought my dad was alcoholic, and I didn't want to be anything like him. I hated him. And uh, turns out I shot past, way past wherever he was in his drinking. So I'm, I'm in AA, and I'm going to meetings. I don't believe in God. I thought the book was kind of poorly written. Um, I was thinking, boy, if you ever have trouble falling asleep, just get that book out and read a couple pages. And ain't it great? Ain't it, ain't it great the wind stopped blowing? Is well, this supposed to help me? And and I don't have a sponsor. And so I'm I'm coming to meetings as an existentialist, uh, with, and I have nothing going for me, and all these feelings. That, that I've been pushing down all those years. That I had nothing to treat them with, and they keep coming up to the surface. And um, I had to do something about it. But what happened, when I was going to these meetings, sitting next to you, I ended up catching alcoholism from you. And one day I raised my hand, and I said, I'm James, I'm an alcoholic. And somebody said, oh, at last, it's unanimous. <laughs> no. Everybody else already knew. So, I have a Father Terry, who, who's a member of AA, says you can't change something you can't name. I, I had to be able to name what was wrong with me to be able to do something about it. And that's the name for what's wrong with me. I'm an alcoholic. And now that I know that, I have to take the treatment for it. And that's what I do in Alcoholics Anonymous. This is the place I come to, to treat my alcoholism. Instead of the way that I was doing it, it was smoking pot. 
And so I'm looking at the big book, and I'm thinking, there's probably something in here someplace about marijuana, because, and I know, I understand singleness of purpose, and I understand that, that if you want to be here and have this work for you, you have to catch alcoholism. And what you did to catch it, really, all our stories are different. In fact, I sponsor a guy whose sobriety date is the last time he did nutmeg. And we call him Nutmeg Steve. And, you know, it's like there's these people in AA. And I met one of them today. It's called uh, um, Lucky You Jack. And we had a machine gun Tony and a, a SWAT team Ron and shotgun Nancy and boxcar Bill. And, like, these people are going to help me? Like, I don't see how. But it turns out that, you know, they, they could save my life. But uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking for this. I'm looking. I want to see something in the book about, about marijuana because I'm thinking it must be in there someplace. I'm not the only one who smoked pot. To, it was part of my drinking career. And uh, I'm looking and I'm looking and I can never find anything. I did see one line that kind of made sense to me. It says something about being constitutionally incapable of being honest with yourself. I think, well, that kind of refers to marijuana because when I'm smoking pot, I'm lying to myself. And uh, finally, I found it. It's in the book. It's buried in the book on page one. It says, here lies a, a Hampshire grenadier who caught his death drinking small cold beer. A good soldier is never forgot if he died by musket or by pot. So it's in the book. And they don't talk about really hard drugs till page seven. So, but I have alcoholism. And... I, ha- I wasn't treating it other than going to meetings. And that only worked for a certain period of time. And I, I was able to put together about six months. And I'm, I'm unraveling. I've got to do something. It's one of those, like, I'm going to drink, blow my brains out, or work the program. And uh, my sister told me about a guy in Sacramento named Howard. And uh, I went to see him. Now, I'd been to shrinks before. I'd been to... Uh, psychologist before, and uh, I, I lied to them and uh, paid them the money and left, and, and nothing ever happened. Nothing ever good happened. And uh, somebody told me once that alcoholics should really go to veterinarians because they're used to guessing what's wrong with their patients. <laughs> I was thinking, I never told them the truth. So, so I go to Howard, and uh, he's a has a family practice. But he's a member of AA also. And I sat in Howard's office for an hour, and I snot cried. I had chunks coming out of me, and I cried. And I, and I told Howard the truth about me. And my whole drinking career had been one of secrecy. I had this, the book, to, I'm in the book. If you read the book, you know all about me. I don't even have to stand here. You know all about me by reading that book. I lived a double life. I had a job in the daytime where I was working for an advertising agency. I had a tie on. And at nighttime, I'd drink in these sleazy bars, and I had a, I was sleazy, and I was uh, secretive, and I was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and I didn't want anybody to know me, and I never let anybody get close to me, and I moved around a lot, and uh, I tried to stay ahead of whatever I thought was after me. But I sat in Howard's office, and I told him about me, and I'd never done that before to anybody, and it it was scary. And Howard, at the end of the hour... He got out a piece of paper, and he wrote on the top, prescription, and he wrote, get on your knees and pray. And he handed me that. He said, this guy's not a doctor. I mean, he's just, and, uh, and I paid him $50. It's called a $50 fifth step. And uh, you can get him for free in AA if you have a sponsor. <laughs> but I, I paid $50 for this. He charged 120 more recently. He died last year, but. I don't know why I did this, but I, st- I started to do what Howard said on the piece of paper. I didn't even believe in God. And I started to, in the morning, I say, God, what do you want me to do? And at night, I say, or give me the power and give me the power to do it. And at night, I say, thank you. About this time, my life started to get a little better, and I bought a new car. And it was the nicest car I'd ever had. It was a sports car. And uh, I was driving. At that time, I had an alcoholic truck. And... Uh, you know what they look like. You know, cracked windshield, door panels a different color, springs coming up in the seats, no, somebody else's tags on the back, ball tires, no insurance, uh, beer cans every place. 
And uh, I bought this nice new sports car. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this, and I start going to a lot of meetings because uh, I'm trolling for a date. I haven't had a date for a long time. I'm a ba- I was a bachelor when I got sober. I was a 39-year-old bachelor. I had a date in maybe five years. And because I wouldn't go out with anybody to get in that truck. If you were getting that truck with me, I didn't want to have anything to do with you, really. So <laughs> that, that made for a very lonely life. I was lonely. I, didn't, I had no idea how lonely I was. It was one of those kind of things where I didn't know until I was with you. And I started to not be lonely. And I could look and see how lonely I was. I was empty. I was a walking dead person. And I have this new car now, and I'm, and I'm, and I also, at, at about this same time, I get a sponsor. I got a number from Howard of somebody who gave me another number, and it was a woman named Donna. And I call this woman named Donna, and I ask her if she'd be my sponsor. I'd never met her before, never seen her in a meeting. I didn't know her, and she said she would. She'd be my sponsor if I would work the steps with her. I'd go to four meetings a week, and I'd journal in a notebook and visit her with her once a week and share my journal with her. And I agreed to do that. And what what happened was I was I started doing these things that they made no sense to me. I knew they wouldn't work, and I didn't agree with them. But I started to feel better. I started to feel better inside. And it was one of my early spiritual experiences where, oh, I don't have to understand this stuff. Nor do I have to agree with it. Don't come up to me afterwards and ask me my opinion of this. It doesn't matter what I think of this. It's what I do. It's a program of action. It's kind of like going to the gym. If you go to the gym and lift weights, you get stronger. It doesn't matter what you think about going to the gym. You can think whatever you want to go. You just go to the gym and lift the weights. So I started to, I started to realize that this was something, uh, there was something going on here that I didn't understand that was powerful, and it was just enough of a glimpse of it to want to do more of it. So I'm out, I'm out with my car going to a lot of meetings, and uh, I met a woman in AA, and uh, her name is Betty. She's also here tonight. And Betty and I started to, uh, I started to date Betty, and what that meant was we went to a meeting together. Uh, and I heard somebody say at a meeting that they were afraid of women. And, Whoa, you said that out loud? I mean, I, I told you before what would happen if I hadn't drank. And I was scared of women. I, I was, they, they, they scared me for whatever reason. So for, for me and Betty, it was like, we'll go to a meeting together. And after the, after the meeting or after the date, I'd, wa- I'd take her home and walk her up to her door holding hands. I don't know whether we should say the Lord's Prayer or I should kiss her. I mean... <laughs> I don't know if anybody else is planning on doing any dating here in AA. I don't know. You know, if you're here for that reason, I will tell you that the odds are really good. But the goods are really odd. <laughs> that, that's me, too. <laughs> Betty and I recently celebrated 26 years of marriage. There's, You can, you can uh, have a relationship in AA, and it can be very successful. And, and our relationship is proof of that. So I start meeting with Donna, and I start journaling in this book. And I start taking it to her and reading what I write. And I'm amazed at this stuff. I, I, when I'm reading it, I'm amazed at what I had written. It surprised me. It was, I wrote that, and I started to find out about myself. I didn't realize how out of touch I was with, with me. And it's like I, I got sort of introduced to myself. And what, I, what Donna pointed out to me real early on is the, the steps have little numbers in front of them. And so I had to go back and start over again. I'd done this $50 fifth step, but I had to go back over and start with one. And uh, I went back and I looked over my life. And I'd, uh, just as the book describes, when I, when I took a drink, I couldn't predict what was going to happen. And when I wasn't drinking... I either wanted to drink or I was planning on drinking or I was, I was convincing myself that it would be different next time. One of the examples that I had that, that helped me to realize the, the, the depth of my problem just fairly soon prior to stopping uh, drinking is I wanted to prove I didn't have a problem. 
Now, I wasn't looking at all the reasons why I had a problem. I was trying to see why I didn't have a problem. What I thought is this. If I can quit drinking for 30 days, I certainly don't have a problem because you can't not drink for 30 days if you're a problem drinker. So I stopped drinking for 30 days. And I think I did pretty well, pretty close. I might have smoked a little pot, but I don't think I did. And on the 30th day, I had a glass of wine with a friend to celebrate not drinking, and which makes sense to an alcoholic. And uh, this was at noon. I had a drink at noon, and I was in jail at midnight. I took that drink, and it went so well that I decided to have another drink, or the drink decided to have a drink. I don't know who, who decided, but I had another drink. And it's like, when I start, I can't stop. And that's all alcoholism is. I thought it was some big something else, but it just that I can't, I can't drink successfully. But there's a second, there's, a, there's a, what I call step one part B. There's a second part to the powerlessness over alcohol, and that's my life is unmanageable. I believe that my life probably became unmanageable as a result of my inability to see that I was powerless over alcohol. But, but however that happened, I did a poor job managing my life. I did a very lousy job as managing my life. And I've become clearer the last few years how, how much that I'm, how, how much important it is to me to not be the manager. My life looks really good now, but it's because I'm not managing it. And what I've decided to, to do is I don't ask the question why. Why is a management question. There's a lot of things in the world that I want to ask. Why is this? Why is that? It's like, for me, it's not a good question because I'm not in management. I'm in footwork. So I do footwork, and I stay out of management. And I let this power that I got in my life that I found here be the manager. And uh, I had an example of recently of how that works in my life. I retired uh, last year from a job that I had for 15 years, and I wanted to have an adventure. So I decided to join the Peace Corps. And uh, I talked my wife into joining the Peace Corps because we had to go as a couple. So we did a lot of applications and interviews, and, and we were all set to go to Africa uh, last August. And I had something come up in some blood work that I did for when I was getting my medical clearance, and I was turned down by the Peace Corps. And after I was turned down, I was thinking, what in the world was I thinking? I don't need to go to Africa to be of service to people. And that same week, I got two new sponsees in Auburn. So it's like God was doing for me. The manager, this manager was taking care of me in a way that, that I couldn't even have done it myself because I thought that I should go to Africa. Well, the manager thought, no, you stay at Auburn where you are. You've got plenty to do right here where you are. So it's like I do the footwork, and I stay out of the results. And that works really well for me. So that's how I took step one. Uh, step two, we all have stories of really crazy stuff that we've done. I'm sure that we could all stand up here and, and tell a few crazy stories. And what I came to realize is that the most insane thing that I ever did, I did when I was sober. I picked up another drink. And it's like, for me, for a guy like me, that's crazy. Because I, you know what happens when I take a drink. Same thing happens to you. So I was able to see, okay, I'm nuts. I keep doing this over and over again when I'm sober. So I need help. That's how I was able to do the second step. So step three, this is, getting, this is getting serious now, step three, because I'm still not real warm and fuzzy about this power. In fact, I don't... I remember early on when the word God, when I see the word God in literature, especially in like the 24-hour book, I would just take the word God and take it out of the sentence and put the word love in the sentence. And I realized that the power is love. Love is the power. That's, that's, it's very powerful. There's a line in the third edition that I love, and I always write it when I write in somebody's book, words of truth and love are strong medicine. It's in the story of Join the Tribe. There's strong medicine here. And it's about love. and uh, So anyway, I, don't, I, I still don't have a clear concept of this power. And I'm not really believing much in the power. And then I start, I'm, I'm balking at step three. And I'm, I'm thinking about all, I start looking at all the, I studied philosophy in college. Okay, I like to argue. I'd much rather argue than do anything. <laughs> like, let's, let's, let's talk about it. You know, I, would do a, I have a fabulous... Uh, book collection of meditation. I like to read about meditation rather than meditate, okay? <laughs> and I like to argue rather than do something. So I get to step three, 
And uh, okay, we're gonna. This God thing has really got me, got me going. So I start looking at all the things about AA that are wrong. It's like this doesn't make any sense to me at all. And somebody says this is a disease. You have a disease. And I'm thinking, people with cancer don't have a sponsor and go to meetings all the time. It's like, I don't know. I have to hold hands and do the Lord's prayer. That's a disease. And someone will say. Uh, you don't get in any uh, relationships in the first year. Somebody else would say, you better get a sponsor and tell him all your stuff. That sounds like a relationship to me. <laughs> or someone will say, uh, don't make any major decisions the first year. And they say, but t- make, decide to turn your will and your life over to the care of God. That sounds like a major decision. <laughs> or someone says, you don't, if you haven't had your last drink, you don't remember it. And then in the book it says, you can't remember shit that happened last week. I'm, <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but. <laughs> or someone says, uh, uh, you know, uh, hang in there. And then someone says, let go. Well, you let go or do you hang in there? Which do you do? You have to surrender to win. What does the world does that mean? You have to give it away to keep it. Now, come on. That doesn't make any sense at all. Or uh, the, come join us on the broad highway. And then someone says, says the road narrows. So, <laughs> And then on one, on one page that Jay read, it says within two lines of each other, it says, there is one who has all power. And the line before that says, remember we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful. Well, who has the power, God or alcohol? I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I think about that stops me from doing anything. Um, that same, the same thing that, that was read. Uh, it says, uh, may you, God, may you find him now. You turn the page, it says, God could and would if he were sought. Well, do you have to find him or you got to look for him? You know, I'd... My favorite, though, is half measures avail us nothing. You turn a little farther along, you'll be amazed before you're halfway through. <laughs> so I go to my sponsor and I said, this stuff is so contradictory. It's so confusing. I don't want to... I... She said... It's good to be confused. It means you're open-minded a little bit. It means you don't have all the answers. And then I looked at my life and I looked at my drinking. I mean, I had uh, I just graduated from UCLA and I would, I'd gone to Europe to wander around. And I'd borrowed 200 bucks from somebody because I was broke. And I spent it all in one night. And I went to this um, mission in Munich and they sprayed me with all this lice stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, my life was full of contradictions too. And... Um, it says something in the book about, in a lot of ways, we're normal. A lot, a lot of our behavior is normal, except when it comes to alcohol. I'm thinking, you know, that's true. I've never gone into a grocery store and said, hey, can I buy everybody a loaf of bread? <laughs> but I spent that 200 bucks in one night with people I didn't even know. So, so I came to realize that what I decided, I didn't realize that this is what I decided, but I can see now this is what I decided. I decided to let AA change me rather than me try to change AA. And what I did is I made a decision to work the AA program. So in step three, the important word for me was decision. I decided to, that, I, that you weren't all lying to me at once and that if I did what you had done, my life would get better. So I decided to work the rest of the program. And I thought for a long time, instead, turn my will and my life over to the control of God. It's a C word, but it's over the care of God. So I turned my will and my life over to the care of Alcoholics Anonymous. And you've done very well with me when I let you into my life. And I followed your suggestions. So that got me to step four. And uh, I I have a really bad memory. I think my wife calls it purposeful forgetting. But uh, I don't want to remember a lot of things. I don't particularly recall having a very happy childhood for whatever reason. Could have been alcoholism in the family. I uh, barely remember being in high school. And so I'm looking at this uh, blank piece of paper, and I'm wondering what to put on the paper about my inventory. And then I, I read in, the, in our literature, it says, you know, it's like the can's on your shelf now. What, what's, what's going on right now? And I put my dad's name on a piece of paper, and I hated him. He, I don't even know why, but I, for probably a period of six or seven years, I wouldn't even talk to him. I saw him out across the street, and... Uh, I have no idea why. I put his name on the paper, and I wrote a couple sentences, and I started to cry. 
And I started to have all these feelings of, of, of loss and, and sadness. And, it, it, and I called my sister, and I, and I told her what I was doing. And I called in work that day. I didn't go to work. And I just kind of cried and, and went over to her house and shared with her. And, and a lot of these feelings I had of, of anger and hate just washed away. It was like the first time that I was willing to look at my side of the street. And, and it, my relationship with him, with him changed that day. He didn't change a bit. But I changed. And um, I did my, I did my uh, sex inventory and my fears list. And I had, I had God on my fears list, uh, which is not uh, a user-friendly relationship. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> I'm able, I'm able to change that. And I had women on that list, too, and, and that's changed, too. And um, I go to do my fifth step, and it's kind of a rainy November day. And uh, I went out to this uh, place where I had been growing pot. And uh, it was, a, it was a, a white trash trailer that I'd lived in. And uh, on the way out there, my sponsor, uh, I had picked her up at her house, and we are driving out there. And it was one of the days that the... the the garbage collector was coming to pick up the trash cans. There was a lot of, a lot of cans had been knocked over, and there was a lot of garbage on the streets. And, uh, you know, dogs had knocked the cans over or something. And, and she was saying something about, boy, there sure is a lot of trash laying around today. I, I need to change my focus. And um, I, I did my fifth step, and I, I looked at my life like a garbage can. And I was, it's like, it, it was a, I was, I, I, I thought that I just, I had, I totally ruined my life and wasted it and thrown it away. And, uh, you know, I, I was a pretty neat kid, and I had dreams. My mom had dreams for me, and I could have been a contender. And uh, alcohol took that all away. And, and I had a lot of guilt and shame and remorse about the life that I'd lived. And I took that garbage can, and I tipped it out when I shared all of my stuff with my sponsor. And on the way driving back, we saw a rainbow. And uh, it, was a, it was a really powerful experience for me. Um, and then the book... Uh, on page 75, it, it talks about the promises of, of when you do that. And for the longest time, I couldn't understand what, what possible sense it would make to do this. I remember asking a lot of people, what, what, you know, why am I doing this? Just do it. Do it and you'll find out. And I did it and I found out. And I felt the nearness of my creator. And I felt at peace inside of my own skin. And I don't think I'd ever felt that way before. What a deal. I got excited about my sobriety that day. And I went home and I did six and seven. And that's deceptive because it's only like a couple little paragraphs on one little page. And uh, I think this is going to be easy. <laughs> Not. There's a, my, my, uh, by, by the way, I have a sponsor named Jack now. And Jack uh, is a teacher. Uh, he's an air traffic controller teacher. In my last job that I had, I worked for the, a teacher. I was also a teacher at the Department of Corrections. So he's a controller, and I'm a corrector. And we got issues. Yeah. So six and seven. Uh, and in, in the meantime of all this, I marry Betty. Okay? And uh, Betty has two children from a previous marriage. So I get to be a husband and a stepdad and she has a sister who's got kids and an uncle all on the same day. And I don't know how to do any of this stuff. I'd never been married before. I'd never had kids before. I, I, I just had no idea. Well, I, it took me a while with six and seven before I, I you know, I, I, I wanted to be... I wanted to be the best me that I could be, and I was starting to learn how to be accepting of myself and live in my own skin. And, but I had, de- I had defects, and I, and I had a little trouble pinning what, what the name was for it. But I finally came to realize that, that the, the main defect that I have that drives me the most, I call it fault-finding. You're not going to do it right, and I'm going to point it out to you that you're not doing it right, and I'm going to push you out of my life. I did that my whole life. And I ended up by myself drinking and using drugs. And that doesn't work when you're a husband and a father and an uncle. So I have these two stepkids and, and a wife. And it turns out that they get to be, they're my main teachers. The people that are closest to me are my main teachers. And I learned a lot of lessons from especially the, especially the two children. 
Sean was 13 when I came into his life as his stepdad, and Angela was seven. And uh, how about Angela first? Angela had a, uh, she had a dog from hell. She was a Dalmatian. I don't know if he has any Dalmatians, but they're stupid, okay? <laughs> and, and, and this dog, as I was driving home, I, I, I could see that I'd get madder and madder and madder. The closer I got to home, I'd be in my driveway, and I was like, I was mad. And I had to turn around one day and go back to my sponsor's house. Because this dog would, would, was just not really very well trained. And I pretty much was going to step in dog shit at some point between getting out of the truck and getting into my house. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to do this fault-finding thing that I've identified as being not, not good for relationships with people. And so my sponsor said, just step over it. Okay. So, and, I, and I started treating Angela like... You treated me when I came to AA. Like, you, I treated her like a newcomer to AA. Because when you walk through that door, I have a love for you that's indescribable. It's like the love that you had for me when I walked through the door. And I want you to be successful. And I want you to, to have everything good in life. And, and I don't, it, it, all the bagging stuff you bring with me doesn't matter. I just love you just the way you are. And I started doing that with my daughter. And I started writing her notes, telling her what, what, how happy I was to be her dad and, and what a great daughter she was. And I stopped criticizing her. If her room was really a mess, I just closed the door. And uh, I just, I, I didn't get perfect yet, but I got a lot better at not criticizing her about anything. And my relationship with her started to improve a lot. In fact, many years later, she came to me and asked me to walk her down the aisle. And I'm just the stepdad. And, uh, and I got to write the checks for the wedding, too, because I had a good job. <laughs> and I was happy to do that. I was honored to do that. She was my daughter. And her father, her biological father, was at the wedding. He came up to me and thanked me for raising his daughter. You gave me that. I didn't know how to do that. I'm a fault finder. I'm going to push you out of my life. Sean, at 13 was just starting on his, in his disease. And I didn't know the extent of it. I don't think that my wife Betty did either. But um, it was about uh, five years. I was five years sober when he uh, borrowed my car one day, uh, my sobriety car. That's what I called it, too, my sobriety car, which I loved. I had a big teddy bear in the back. And it was, it was really a real special gift that I thought that, I, that came from the universe for me being sober. Well, he had my, took my sobriety car out, and he smashed it. And he almost killed uh, his passenger. In fact, his passenger was in a coma for a week. So he was in juvenile hall. He peed in the back of the cop car, and he was in juvenile hall. And, and uh, it was a mess. It was a mess. And uh, uh, that was just one of the things that happened that year. That same year, Betty's sister was killed in an automobile accident, and my mom died. And one of, her, one of my sister's uh, children was paralyzed. He's five. He's still in a wheelchair. And so it was, it was a, a real year, a year of uh, working my program, of doing the things that you taught me to do so I didn't have to take a drink. But I was really angry about Sean and my sobriety car. And, uh, and I was saying so, too. I was, I was mad. I was resentful. So people from al came over to our house. They, did, they do house calls in Auburn. <laughs> and um, al Anon's a fabulous organization. One of the women whom I was complaining to about Sean smashing my sobriety car said, well, maybe it's Sean's sobriety car. And that was his last drink. He was 17 years old. He just celebrated 23 years of sobriety. And, uh, you know, that was just a car. And he married a girl who was sober when she was 16. And they both have a master's degree and they have a fabulous life. They have a fabulous life. In fact, next week we're going back to North Carolina where they live because uh, our oldest grandson is graduating from high school. So with a lot of lessons that I learned about being a fault finder, about not being a fault finder, I learned uh, washing dishes. Because in, in this house with these people that I told you about, none of them knew how to wash the dishes right. And uh, it's, like, it's like I have this gift. Maybe it's a curse. I don't know. 
I have this gift of knowing how to do everything, and I'm going to tell you. <laughs> and so you're not doing the dishes right. You do them like this or like this. And so what I did, because I don't want to be a fault finder anymore, is I started doing the dishes myself. You can tell by looking at me, and my hands are all, I'm a gardener. I like to garden. And it's, it's like, it's a chance for me to get my hands clean by doing the dishes. So what I would do is I would stand at the sink, and I, would, I didn't want to do them with resentment or anger, so I'd stand at the sink until I get quiet enough to just do the dishes. And so I would just do the dishes. And uh, it added a lot of peace in our house by just having me do the dishes. I still do them today. I like doing the dishes. And I read someplace there's over 60 ways to do the dishes. <laughs> and uh, I thought there was one. You know, my way. Uh, step eight seemed pretty simple. I just made a list of, of the people in, uh, that I'd harmed in institutions. Uh, nine, uh, I, I moved around a lot. And so I, I had uh, a little... A lot of people that I that crossed my path, I, I have no idea who they are or where they are. I, have, I just have no recollection of what, what to do. So there's, I'm willing to make amends if I would see them and, and could address it to them. But, um, you know, I was sober a couple of years before I could, knew you could move in the daytime. Do you know that? I always moved at night. I could move in about 20 minutes. And uh, so anyway, uh, but the, the people that harmed my most were... Pro- Probably my, mostly my mom, but my, my dad also. Uh, and my mom had cancer the last, uh, about this time when I had maybe, she, well, she died when I had five years sober. So I was able to be a son to her in the last years of her life. I was able to go to her house, uh, take her for a ride, show her up, take her to appointments. I, I, was, I could be a son, and you taught me how to do that. My dad, uh, I, we had built a new house. Uh, and, I'd, and, and he was having some problems financially, and a second marriage he'd had had fallen apart. And I invited him to come and live with me, and he moved into my home. Betty and I, just invi- we embraced him and said, come live with us. You can stay with us forever. And he was there about 20 days, and he got mad about something and said, I'm out of here. And, and he died a very lonely man. Uh, that was his choice. But I learned how to be, how to set the record straight with him, and you taught me how to do that too. And, uh, but the most, the, the couple of amends that there were the most powerful ones for me were financial amends. One was $5 and one was $10. The $10 one, I was going to a, a restaurant at lunchtime uh, on Wednesdays. I was a secretary of the step study meeting. I went to a, a restaurant at lunchtime, and one day I got $10 too much in change. And I just put it in my pocket, thinking, if you can't count, it's not my job to teach you. And, uh, but I knew it wasn't quite right. Because I was, you know, trying to live this spiritual life. And um, a week or so later, the woman comes to me who owns the place and says, oh, I'm selling the restaurant. And I'm thinking, if I'm going to give the money back, i got to give it back today. So I, I said, well, can I talk to you for a minute? And I took her aside. And uh, I said, I was here the other day, and I got $10 too much, and I want to give it back to you. And I handed her the $10. She, Are you, sure? you sure, she said? I said, I wouldn't be giving you this back if I wasn't sure. And I gave her the $10, and I started to cry. I'm this, you know, macho guy in this restaurant. I'm, there's tears are streaming down my face, and it was the best ten dollar high I ever had. <laughs> Whoa! It gave me some courage to pay the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> the five dollar amend. Uh, Sean graduated from high school, went to San Diego to live and go to school. And he called me up one day after he was in San Diego for a little while, and he said, uh, I, "I've been stealing money from you when I was at home, and I want to pay it back." And he, didn't, he had just a little job. He was, you know, pounding nails for somebody and going to school. And he said, I can send you five bucks. And I think, wow. I just, wow, he's got it. I mean, we say, this is how it works. This is why it works. And we look at step nine and say, this is when it works. It starts to really work when you do step nine. And Sean was doing step nine. He sent me $5. Because I, I was a waiter a, a long time ago, and I had a jar of money. Don't leave any money on a table. I scoop it up automatically. But... Uh, <laughs> He had a, I had a big jar of money in my office, and I went and looked at it. It was all nickels. He'd taken all the quarters out, all the dimes out, and been buying pot or something. So he sends me $5. And so I wanted him to kind of get an idea of how powerful that was, so I sent him back 100 And then the five started coming faster. <laughs> He's not stupid either, you know. So 
Step 10 is the step that I really, that speaks to, my, to me the most, I think, because it, it allows me to identify the problem. Because I always thought you were the problem, or the Lutherans were the problem, or my dad was the problem, or the Republicans were the problem, or the Osama bin Laden's the problem, or whatever. But it turns out that I'm the problem. It's me and my attitudes. And I have the tools that you've given me to do something about me and my attitudes. So step 10 is a really powerful step for me because I really like the feeling that I get when I'm at peace. We talk a lot about the disease. I'm, I'm ill at ease. But when I'm quiet, when my, when, my, when my mind's quiet and my heart is gentle, I'm in a beautiful place. And I learn over years of sobriety that I like that spot and I want to stay there. So when I get sidetracked, which is often and easy, I have the tools to get back to that spot. It's like when I drive down the street, right now we can go up to the corner there and down there, there's a, there's a light there and it goes green, yellow, red, green, yellow, red, green, yellow, red. It's doing that all the time. When we're sleeping, it doesn't matter. It's always doing that. I pull up to it and it's red and I got a story. And it's like I had to learn that it is not the problem. The light's not the problem. It's me. The most misquoted line in, in Alcoholics Anonymous literature is what we were like, what happened and what we're like now. People say what it was like. Well, it, it's green, yellow, red, green, yellow, red. It's just, it's just what, doing what it's doing. But, but I can do something different. And when I change the way I look at things, the things that I'm looking at are change. They change. Buddha's got a great story. He says he was, he was stubbing his toe a lot because he went barefoot all the time. And he was thinking, boy, I wonder if there's enough cows in the world to cover the whole world with rawhide so it'll be smooth and I won't stub my toe anymore. And he realized there weren't enough cows to do that, so he put leather on his feet, and the whole world changed. Whoa. I know a guy that when he gets to a red light, every red light, he thanks God for his sobriety. I know another guy that closes his eyes for a second and just... Uh, kind of thinks on his higher power. He says, they'll always let you know when the light goes green. <laughs> Don't worry about that. <laughs> There's a line in the uh, uh, 12 and 12. Whenever I'm disturbed, you know what the cause or something wrong with me. It's not you. It's me. It's always me. And, and thank you for the tools that I have to know that and do something about that. Uh, step 11 I saw something that I really identify with step 11. It says, sought by paying attention to improve my conscious contact with God. So if I'm paying attention, I'm where God is. Because God is always in the now. He's not in yesterday. He's not in tomorrow. He's right here, right now. So I love it at meetings when people say, what's the topic? Which they say at every meeting. And I always say, it's paying attention. When you're paying attention, you hear what the topic is. <laughs> but it's like, you know, when I was drinking, I was always, when I was at work, I was thinking about being at home. When I was at home, I was thinking about being at work. I was never where I was. I was always some, I was about two drinks away from really getting it together and feeling good. And it's like, I lived my life like that. And now I can think of no place I'd rather be than right here, right now with you, because that's where God is. That's where the power is. And we have, we have power tools here. We plug in to the power, and the tools become available to us. Uh, step 12, uh, I, th- I thought I said uh, uh, try to cram this message to people. <laughs> I, I did a lot of that f- for a long time. And, uh, but I've, I've, woken up, I've woken up. It's like I'm awake from doing this work. And I've woke up, and my, my attitude is different. I'm a different person. And the book talks about that. I've had a personality change sufficient to, to overcome alcoholism. And I did that by doing these things that I just told you about that didn't make any sense to me. So I try to, uh, I try to carry the message. One of my primary ways of doing it, other than sponsorship, which I do a lot of, is I uh, give people CDs to listen to. There's a lot of wonderful messages out of AA people uh, uh, that are available on CDs. And Doug has a whole table full of them. It's a wonderful way to hear the message. When you're driving around, get out of your head a little bit and hear the, hear the, hear the message of recovery. So I do a lot of that. Uh, I spent 15 years working in a prison as a teacher. 
And uh, the inmates and the, con- the convicts are, st- are starved for something that, that can give them some hope. So I brought a lot of CDs into the prison system, and uh, they were very well received. And uh, I want to just say one thing about what, that I didn't realize this at the time, but when I was drinking and, uh, and using, I had this idea of, of getting this barbed wire fence around my property that I had uh, to keep the kids from stealing my pot, keeping the teenagers away. But I, but I wanted to just have the whole world away, away from me and just to have me and my drugs and my alcohol inside this compound that I had created. Uh, and just, I remember saying, I regret that I don't have one life to give them my addiction. It's crazy. And working with the Department of Corrections, I realized and I was reminded that the worst punishment we have in America, the worst punishment we have is to put somebody by themselves it's called solitary confinement. It's the worst thing we do to anybody. I did that to myself and my disease. That's where my disease took me. And so now that I've, I've woken up to the fact that I don't have to live like that anymore. And that's, that's just a really wonderful feeling. And uh, practicing these principles in all my affairs. Uh, I haven't missed my exit on the freeway for a long time because I'm chasing somebody down to teach them how to drive. And I don't know if you've ever done that or not, but I've done that. Uh, I don't count how many uh, items you have in your basket at the grocery store to make sure it's less than 10. Uh, I pick up paper. When I, I used to complain about all the trash I saw. Now I just pick it up. So I've learned how to, to live a life where I'm in the solution rather than in the problem. Um, what's the, the last part about it? Carry this message? Okay, I've, I've, I've woken up, and I try to carry the message, and I try to practice principles. And... Um, there's a line in the uh, 12 and 12 that says, this is a design for living uh, that when practiced on a regular basis expels the obsession to drink and makes the, the person usefully and happily whole. That's happened to me. I'm useful and happily whole as a result of doing this work from this empty shell of a person that I was when I got here. Unfortunately, I see a lot of people. I worked in the prison system for a long time. I was a DUI teacher for maybe 15 years. I've been 28 years sober in AA. And when I was in college, I worked in a mortuary for a short while. So I know what happens to people who, who are alcoholics. And uh, we're a very small, lucky few that are here. And what I see in this passing parade, I see a lot of people who were, are here at one point. I remember doing a, a survey in prison. And I asked guys, have you ever been in AA? And every one of them who said they had said it was the best years in their life. I said, well, what are you doing in prison? If it was the best time in your life, what are you doing here? Well, we know what, they, what happened. They stopped doing it. And I, it's, like, it's like sobriety is this escalator. And the escalator is going down like this. And I'm on the escalator, but I want to go up. So in order to go up, the escalator that's going down, I've got to keep going. I've got to keep moving, or the escalator is going to take me back down again. Well, sobriety is kind of like that. And what I want to just share here uh, is to what I think that would look like. If a person is uh, working the steps backwards, step 12, I have principles I live by. It's a doggy dog world, and I'm going to get mine before you get it. 11, I have a prayer. It's me, 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 more, 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 now, 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 amen. <laughs> I, I take inventory of yours. You're a, you're a lousy dresser, you're a poor driver. You work a shitty program? Nine. I, we're not going to pay the money back to heck with nine. Eight. I got a list. It's a shit list, and your name's on it. <laughs> Seven. Humility is not one of my faults, but if I had one, I think I'd choose humility. Uh, six. Um, I'm willing. I love that Frank Sinatra song. I'm willing to do it my way. I did it my way. Five. I'm not going to cop anything, even if you have pictures. Four. I can't get a break. The world's always picking on me. It's like this shit fairy follows me around. It's always dumping on my head. If I fell into a barrel of tits, I'd come up sucking my thumb. It's, just, it's not fair. Three. <clears throat> I'm not going to turn my will over to God. What if he screws my life up? I'm not going to do that. Two, thank you for all this 
really clear information you've given me about the nature of the disease. I think that now I can handle it very much because I have all the information that I need. One, I think I'll have a drink. You know what happens when I take a drink? Click, click. You know what happens when you put handcuffs on you? You can't even trust it with your own hands. Empty your pockets, sir. Take your watch off. You have to. You go to jail. Take your watch off. I already know what time it is. It's time to have another drink. Empty your pockets. Here's my sobriety coin. When I, when I was drinking, I used to always empty my pockets in the morning. I never had a dime. I, it always, I was broke every time. So I keep my money with my coin. Because when I, ha, when I have sobriety, I have money. And when I'm drinking, I have no money. It says on this coin, to thy own self be true. I don't need that because I'm going to be lying to myself. I spent... 25 years lying to myself. Car key. There's a little, little camel here. Camel can go 24 hours without a drink. Starts his day on its knees. Empty your wallet. Picture of my granddaughter. I won't be able to see her. Driver's license. That was leave, I was losing that when I got here. Credit cards. I didn't have any of those. I won't have any of those again. Wedding ring. My finger's a little chubby right now. I can't get that off. But the, 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 the marriage is gone. I'd put my teeth out here, but that's probably inappropriate. <laughs> everything, everything good in my life, everything good in my life is a direct result of my sobriety and my relationship with you. Do you think I want to give that up for a drink? No way. These steps are powerful. One, two, three gets me right with God. Four, five, six gets me right with myself. Six, seven, and eight gets me right with you. Ten keeps me right with myself. Eleven keeps me right with God. And twelve keeps me right with you. What a powerful deal. Thanks for letting me share.